morning, my sisters and my brothers. I'm Dr. Lewis State, pastor of the Village Church. I want to welcome you here today, for this is certainly the day that the Lord has made, and we shall rejoice and be glad in it. I hope that you're having a wonderful uh, morning on this uh, June the 7th. Uh, this is the month for Black Music Month. Uh, throughout June, started by President Jimmy Carter several years ago. It's a good time to get you know familiar with some of uh, the music that we have created in this country, jazz and R&B and the blues and gospel and, and all kinds of other music. Familiarize yourself, man. Spend the day listening to something that lifts your spirit so you can enjoy yourself. And also, I just want to say that this is just a good time to be alive. So let me, I want to just pray wherever you are. And listen, you know, if you start a watch party wherever you are, um, if you can get some other people uh, to jump on uh, to, to our service right now, you know, inbox your friends, uh, text them, let them know the village is on. We won't be long, so you got to get them now. And wherever you are, you're on your couch or you're just eating breakfast or just waking up, let's pray together. God, we are so grateful for this day. We are thankful for how you've kept us alive, how you've kept us in our minds, as the old folks would say, in our right mind. We thank you also for your protection for all the young people, in particular, all the people who are uh, practicing civil disobedience and protesting uh, the injustices in this country. Uh, we thank you, God. We even pray, God, for people who have been hurt in the midst of protesting. I don't even know the, the older man, gentleman's name, 75 years old, up here in New York, who was pushed down by the police and hit his head on the ground. God, I pray for him and all those who've been suffering. Also, God, in the midst of this pandemic, we, we pray, God, for people who are, who are dealing with uh, COVID-19. All of us are people who have been sick, have had the virus. We pray for families who've lost loved ones, and we lift them up today. God, we pray today that you would allow us to experience your presence and the breath of your life. This is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, Elder Jackie is going to come. She's going to share with us some things what you need to do with your health. But also, if you're going down to protest, perhaps some things you need to do to protect yourself when you go down to protest as well. Good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm going to read just one verse of scripture um, from Genesis chapter 2, verse 7. And it says, Then the Lord God formed a man from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and the man became a living being. George Floyd and Michael Garner both said, I can't breathe. I can't breathe. Breath is the air taken into or and expelled from the lungs. It has many uh, benefits, it improves circulation, slows and regulates heartbeat, improves digestion, and helps to relieve stress and many others. Breathing is important because every system of our body relies on oxygen that's taken in when we breathe. And we can't survive without breathing. I want you this week to uh, Google uh, breathing exercises. There are many. They have, uh, they'll talk about different types of techniques that could be used. You could be doing these breathing exercises while you are perhaps maybe watching Netflix and, you know, catching up on your favorite movie or sitting on the porch uh, taking in some fresh air or listening to music um, these breathing exercises can be done during that time because it's important that we continue to exercise our respiratory system and that comes through the breath. While we are still in this pandemic crisis of the coronavirus, we must continue to protect ourselves. Uh, the coronavirus attacks our respiratory system and that's our breath. So we must continue to wear our masks, they should be, the mask should be over your nose and over your mouth, not just over your mouth like this, but it should be over your nose and your mouth. We must continue to uh, be social distance as much as possible, continue to wash our hands and use hand sanitizers. As we continue to fight for racial justice 
Many people are going down to uh, protest, and it's a marvelous thing. Um, I'm excited about what's happening in our um, African American culture all around the world. And so, but we still need to protect ourselves because the coronavirus pandemic is still here. So you must continue to wear your mask as much as possible. Make sure you try to stay social distance. Wash your hands when you get back home from protesting. Take your clothes off, take a shower, get yourself clean to make sure that you don't bring other germs into your household. And we wanna continue to do that because it's just so important that we continue to do both. We need to continue to fight for racial justice and we need to continue to fight against the coronavirus. So take care of yourselves this week. Remember to look up breathing exercises and exercise your lungs. Thank you, Elder Jackie, for that. And those, please keep these announcements in mind and, and these wonderful tips you brings us each week. I mean, a lot of people now who are protesting, and and I'll say a bit more about that in my sermon. But I, I want us to realize that this is very, very serious. Um, people um, really want change, particularly um, black people. And there's some really well-meaning um, whites and others across the world who are looking at this country and want really structural and systemic change. So it's not really a time to be having a block party or think things are just wonderful, but it's it's change. And change takes a determination. It takes a little time. Right now it seems to be uh, sort of the, the end thing, if you will, to be um, the, the, uh, the go-to thing. Everybody wants to say they're supporting Black Lives Matter. I don't know how many emails I got from companies with letters from their CEOs, but really how they can really support us is to, is to look at their structure, mm -hmm. look at where they spend their money, to look at how they, who they support in terms of presidential elections and all the other kinds of things. So it's a great time for us to really look at that. Listen, wherever you are, just tune in. I want, I want to share with, share with you again. Look, get a, get a watch party going, invite some friends. And I'm going to this message today. Now today, I, I want to just look at just one verse of scripture. And some of you, it, it may be familiar to you, because those of you behind the church, but others it may not be. It's from Ecclesiastes, a little small book there in the Old Testament. And I've used this verse, this verse is so powerful to me. It's from chapter number 11, verse 4. And I'm going to read it from two different versions. I'm going to read it from uh, the the Living um, Version of the Bible, or the New Living Translation, and I'm also going to read it from uh, the Living Bible. And so, because they, they, they read a little bit different, but the New Living Translation says it this way. That's chapter 11, verse 4 of Ecclesiastes. Farmers who wait for perfect weather never plant. If they watch every cloud, they never harvest. Now, I'll read that same verse from the Living Bible, and it says it this way. If you wait for perfect conditions, you will never get anything done. I think I need to read that mm. one more time. Mm. If you yeah. wait for perfect conditions, you will never get anything done. The title of this sermon today is one word, now. Now. Let's pray. God, thank you for this word, this opportunity. God, I pray that you allow the Holy Spirit to stand up in my body. And the genius of the Holy Spirit to use my mind to speak through my mouth. I pray now that everyone who's listening or will hear this message will get the word they need for their life. God, I pray this. I pray now. I pray now in your son's name. May the words of my mouth, the meditation of my hearts, be acceptable in your sight, for you are our strength and our redeemer. Amen. All right. I read a book a few years ago entitled Rework by Jason Fried and David Heine Heinmeier Hansen. And chapter three was called Simply Go, with the subtitle Make a Dent in the Universe. The author said, to be great, you need to feel that you're making a difference, that you're putting a meaningful dent in the universe, that you are a part of something important. 
In the summer of 2018, <laughs> I got this idea in my head. Some would call it a vision. I just call it an idea. Some would call it a dream. I just call it an idea in my head that there was a need in our community. There was a need because I realized that children in Ward 7, Benning Heights, where our church is, where the parish is, they don't really eat on weekends. So I started thinking to myself, you know, what could our church do to be different other than what we've been doing, which was having church on Saturday night. And so I, I really believe it was God inspired. And I believe that the village, our church had to do something uh, about it. And particularly with the kids, the children in our community in Benning Terrace, because there was an unmet need. You know, many of our children uh, in this community, uh, they get subsidized lunches through, through the school year. So that's five days a week that they get something. Sometimes they get breakfast and lunch. Then on weekends, a lot of times the food could be scarce. Like I say, working, working class parents, uh, that's another subject for our country, how, how we can be justified in paying people $12 an hour. It took us almost 400 years <laughs> to get $7.50 an hour. And now we, we, we're balking at paying people $15 an hour. But we, we all witnessed here recently because of the pandemic, only took a few weeks for the government to dump down several trillion dollars. And 85% of that money went to all of the big corporations. 85%, not to the people, 85% went to the people who don't really need it. So I said, look, what can we do? So I shared this vision with the members and friends of the village, told them what I saw, what I thought we could do. And so we decided that for the months of June and July in 2018, just two years ago, that the village would try to meet their hunger needs of children in our community. So it was just a simple thing we were gonna do. I got uh, Tia Newman and let us use the community centers up the street from the church where we have our worship services. She opened the doors for us without any charge, gave us the key. Deacon Charlie many times went to get the key and take the key back. And so we had that center. We went up there. I said, we're going to do something real simple. I'm going to, I'm going to preach some, some, some little sermon for kids, you know, which means it's got to be short. And, you know, I got to hopefully explain. And I, so I just started talking about the creation story and some other stuff every week for like five to seven minutes, if that long. Then we had, we had music in the beginning. So we had music and, and uh, we, we had music. And then Kelly uh, Phil, she, she did these crafts every week. She bought the stuff and she taught and all that kind of stuff. And, and then uh, we had food catered in and Elder Jackie and Patience and Crystal and Wanda, a bunch of other people helped sort of serve the food. And it was an interesting time. There we were for two months <laughs> feeding having a great time. One, I remember one incident where uh, I didn't think the adults would be interested in doing crafts and we looked up and they wanted to do the crafts with the children. It was a great time. It was, we had no government funding. I didn't know how much it was going to cost us. We had no real outside source. I figured we could figure out a way to do it. Figure out how it would cost us. And God, and we made it work for two months because there was a need and we did it now. We didn't wait to get a grant. We didn't wait for somebody to give us permission. Uh, we just did it. Now as I fast forward now to this summer of 2020, this escalating violence on black bodies by police, it continues. We're in the midst of a pandemic. The rate at which black Americans are killed by police is more than twice as the rate of white Americans. In July of 2014, the cell phone video captured Eric Garn's final words as a New York City police officer sat on his head and pinned him to the ground on the sidewalk. And his final words was, I can't breathe. Then on May 25th of this year, 2020, the same words were spoken by George Floyd, I can't breathe, who pleaded for release and asked for his mother, 46-year-old man, as an officer knelt on his neck for eight minutes and 46 seconds. That's a long time. You try to be silent or you try to do something for eight minutes and 46 seconds and you realize that at any point that man could have taken his knee off his neck while the other officers just sat around and did nothing. 
they were complicit on a Minneapolis street. I was sick and I was pissed off. Yes, pissed off. I know we're not supposed to say that, but I said it. I was pissed off. I was angry. I was mad. Like many of you, I was trying to figure out what in the world is going on? What, is this happening in my lifetime? Again? 2020? I'm 60 years old. Am I seeing this again? I wanted to, I wanted to rupture. I wanted to go and do something. I couldn't imagine that black people are still dealing with the same injustice that whites often think that we're making up. We're being uh, hysterical. We're, we're, we're playing the race card. All this stuff. And I said to myself and a few others, something has to be done now. It can't wait. We don't need another task force to study it or no solutions. We, we, we had a task force. You know, President Obama had a wonderful task force that studied it. They, they, they have a report. Trump's administration came in, and I guess they put the report in a drawer or just discarded it because they didn't do anything that the report said they should be doing. So, so we don't need another report. We need something now. We need something to be done structurally and systemically about racism. And I said to myself, there's no better time than now. So now eliminates what could have happened in the past or preoccupation of the glory or historical high and low points. You know, I would like to talk about the good old days of the civil rights movement and Dr. King and how we marched. Well, Dr. King is not here. Mm -hmm. We can use his words. Ella Baker is not here. Fannie Lou Hamer is not here. Marcus Garvey and, and Malcolm X are not here. Sojourner Truth, they're not here. But guess what? We are. Yeah. And their spirits are with us. So now is the active participation in the present without God, without regard to anything that will excuse is execution without waiting. So how will I know if I won't do something? Try it now. How will I accomplish what I envision or dream if I don't start now? How many times will you use the excuses for something you thought about, dreamed about, because you were imprisoned by your past and too focused on the future so you fail to act now. Ecclesiastes 11, the whole chapter, deals with the uncertainties of life. And when we look at our text in verse 4, and look at the Living Bible Translation, it says, if you wait for the perfect, for perfect conditions, you will never get anything done. You know, the oppressor always has a way of telling us it ain't the right time. You know, y'all need to just calm down and this this go back and think about it. Because they what they want you to do is go back the way things were. And even some of us, if we're not careful, we we, we say we, we, we want things to turn to a to a place of normalcy. What does that mean for a hundred and forty million poor people in the United States? That's not just black folks. That's poor whites too. Poor Latinos too. 140 million. We only have about 300, 330, 300, maybe 360 million people in the country. So you're talking about oh, we, we're pushing almost half of our country is in poverty. But nobody talks about poverty. Not none of the presidential candidates, not even our Congress or the Senate. It's like poverty doesn't exist. They're so busy lining their pockets and taking care of their little crew and their little group. They don't think about people who are suffering. How in the world can the president, the Congress, and the Senate have free health care, but nobody else can have it? E even, even, even the president lives in subsidized housing, public housing. That's not his house. That's the White House. <laughs> they say it's the people's house, but I don't know about that. <laughs> but the question is, what, 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 are, what, what are you waiting for? What are the excuses you're using or keeping you from doing what's on your heart? What's holding you back from moving on the vision of the dream you had? Don't tell me that we're in the midst of a pandemic. Don't tell me that we're in the midst of police brutality. We, these are things that we've always been dealing with, uh, police brutality. And guess what? Before the pandemic came, black folks in America, we, we were already dealing with health disparities. Just made it worse, but we're already dealing with stuff. So don't tell me this ain't the right time. 
You don't need to quit your job or lose your mind in order to do something that will make a difference in your life and others. You can just stop where you are now. So, so here's what I think we can learn, and I'm done for today, but from Solomon, author who wanted his audience to embrace this concept of now. And it's simply three words. That's all it is. It can't wait. It can't wait. Inventor James Dyson realized that something needed to be done while he was vacuuming his house. He realized that his big vacuum cleaner was constantly losing suction power, thus kept clogging the pores in the bag and blocking the airflow. This was not someone else's imaginary problem. This was a problem he was having <laughs> at the moment. He didn't wait until he got proper funding or waited on R&D that's research and development department to solve what he knew firsthand <laughs> there was a problem. So he decided, no time like the present, to solve the problem. And he came up with the world's first cyclonic, bagless vacuum cleaner, Dyson. <laughs> and many of us have used a Dyson vacuum cleaner at some point in our lives. There's an old adage says that this there's no time like the present. In other words, now. So what is it in your life that can't wait? Is it paying attention to your health? Is it making sure you stay connected to the people that you love and care for? Is the it telling someone that you're sorry for hurting them? Like Drew Brees had to come out and, and make an apology after he made some ill statements uh, about what's going on and about Colin Kaepernick, which happened a few years ago because he was kneeling as a protest, not protesting the military or the police department and per se, but police brutality and inequalities. So he had to come out and make an apology. He, matter of fact, he's made several, several apologies. It, it, the it, is it getting involved in civil unrest, even though you, you think your life is fine? What is your it? Is your it deciding to go back to school or pursuing a degree in something you've been interested in for a long time, but you've made all kinds of excuses from your age and I have enough money uh, to just whatever, I don't think I can do it. Is your it finally starting to pursue your dream of owning your own business, even in the midst of the pandemic, police brutality, and a president that seems to be more comfortable in the bunker than being a stand-up man for all the people in this country, especially those who are hurting. So what is your it? Is your it as a white person waiting or wanting to be in the midst of this frustration and anger that blacks are, are sensing and feeling because we've all witnessed a lynching right in front of our eyes? a display for all the world to see because this person, this young lady, captured what was happening on her cell phone in real time and the video didn't stop. From start to finish, we saw a lynching. Not pictures of it, not some historical event, but in modern time. And now you want to be an ally. Everybody wants to be an ally. I'm not afraid ally is becoming a, a word that we toss around. I'm, I'm so happy that my niece is writing this letter, Lil Pay, uh, to the mayor uh, uh, about this whole business of being an ally. And it's easy now for people to say they want to be an ally. So you want to be an ally. To be an ally is to take on the struggle as your own, number one. Number two, to stand up even when you feel scared. Number three, transfer the benefits of your privilege to those who lack it. And number four, acknowledge that while you too feel pain, the conversation is not about you. Saying you are an ally is much easier than actually being an ally. Saying you are an ally looks good on paper if you're never taken to task for doing nothing. 
Let's not be fooled. Many people are now going to jump on the bag way. We're going to write letters. Some of them may even give a little bit of money. And after the cameras disappear and the marches start, they go back to business as usual. Their structures still haven't changed. The best definition of ally that I think I've found, and probably some others, is by Roxane Gay, who's an author of Bad Feminist. In her article, uh, she quotes Maria Claire on making Black Lives Matter. In it, she notes, black people do not need allies. We need people to stand up and take on the problems born of oppression as their own without remove or distance. We need people to do this even if they cannot fully understand what it's like to be oppressed for their race, for their ethnicity, gender, sexuality, ability, class, religion, or other marker of identity. We need people to use common sense to figure out how to participate in social justice. Don't ask me what you need to do. You need to figure out, particularly when I'm talking to my white brothers and sisters, what you need to do. We did not create this system. This is from you and your ancestors. And the conversations, I talked to my co-author, uh, Dr. Van Gorder, and we got to work on this third book. And one of the things we talked about is that he, as a European American, as a white American, <laughs> has to talk to his own community. That's what his, his job. He don't need to worry about mine because we, we do it. But we can't do the job for you. We, we're, we're exhausted trying to deal with our stuff. And then we got to sit down and explain to you uh, why we are stressed, why we died early. My father was 63 when he died. Prostate cancer. I guarantee you my dad had some stress in his life. I guarantee you he had to deal with some stuff that he couldn't talk about coming up in Alabama. I guarantee you my dad would be alive today if he didn't have to deal with all the stresses of racism and all the stuff that he just probably couldn't even just consciously even articulate. So what are you waiting for? What is the country and many of our so-called leaders waiting for? Time is right for real, real structural change. I know that's hard, but that's, well, hopefully that will produce the justice and an equitable system and change in American culture that a government that works not just for some, but for all. Now, I, now let me park your parenthetical for a moment. I, I, I just really like what the mayor of our city is doing, Mayor Miro Bowser. She's doing a, a great job. And it was a wonderful gesture on her uh, to paint part of, I think, 16th Street leading up to the White House, Black Lives Matter, and change the plaza, plaza down there to, to uh, Black Lives Matter. Uh, it, it, it was wonderful, wonderful gesture. But that gesture won't mean anything if she doesn't adjust the budget. She's cut a lot of stuff that's necessary, like uh, violence prevention programs and other kinds of stuff. She cut them almost by 16 million, but then she put 18 more million in the police budget. How many more millions do we need? They're already close to over 600 million. What she needs to do, she really is serious, is to divest some of that money in the police department, like they've done in California. California's mayor, LA, I think, took $150 million out of the police budget, and he's gonna put it in other places there, and that's what we need. We need to stop modeling cities around the country, modeling our federal budget, which is so crazy. Our military spends $800 plus billion a year. Can you imagine that? Eight hundred billion. And if it took a percentage of the military budget, it will cover health care for everybody, it will cover housing, all kinds of stuff. But we won't do it. You gotta ask yourself the questions. What what kind of country are we in where we, we we're so more interested in our military budget than we're interested in the budget to help mothers to take care of their children. We have cut a free lunch for a child. But we have put more money in the military budget. Now was the time to stop this madness about what happened in Ferguson in 2014. Michael Brown was killed by the police. Freddie Gray's death in Baltimore 2015. Let's not forget Sandra Bland, a 28-year-old year African-American woman from the Chicago area who was taken into custody after some sort of traffic 
violation. And then three days later, they found her hanging in a jail cell. Officially ruled a suicide. You know something's wrong with that. Breonna Taylor busting into her house some two, three, four o'clock in the morning, wherever it was, with a no-knock warrant, which they should be outruled. Shooting. They said they identified it. So I'm, they really, you identified yourself and you're shooting people? Shot up in her bed. Boyfriend's trying to defend himself. He has a registered gun, but now they want to charge him that he was assaulting police, but he, they didn't identify themselves. She's gone, dead, for nothing. They're, they're, they're persons who are looking for us to do something. There are persons who are waiting for us to do something. We've covered the deaths of Eric Donald, Philando Castile, Alton Sterling. Listen, vital moments for some of these people's lives. Eric Garner had just broken up a fight, according to a witness. Ezel Ford was walking in his neighborhood. Michelle Cousseau was changing the lock on her, on her home's door when the police arrived to take her uh, to a mental health facility. Tanisha Anderson was having a bad mental health episode and her brother called 911. Tamir Rice was playing in the park with a toy gun and he was shot. Now, Tisha McKinney was having a schizophrenic episode when she was tased in Fairfax, Virginia. Walter Scott was going to an auto parts store. Betty Jones answered the door to let Chicago police officer in to help her up, upstairs neighbor who called 911 to resolve a domestic dispute. Philando Castillo was driving home from dinner with his girlfriend, shot in his own car. Botham Jean was eating ice cream in his living room in Dallas. Miss Jefferson was babysitting her nephew at home in Fort Worth, Texas. Eric Reason was pulling into a parking spot at a local chicken and fish shop. And Dominique Clayton was sleeping in her bed. <sighs> oh, and these are just the people that we know. <laughs> Ecclesiastics 11 4 says, If you wait for perfect condition, you will never get anything done. You can't wait, and we can't wait for perfect conditions or perfect time because there is no perfect time except now. You can't wait to get something done when you think the time is right. There's no better time than now. Listen, we've got to work to, to solve our problems. You've got to work to solve your own problems. But many times we also need help. We don't need someone from the outside to tell us necessarily what to do. That's why we're talking to the white community because there's some things you can do for yourself and that needs to be done for yourself. Give this last little illustration. Listen, uh, there's a former track coach whose name was Bill Bowerman. He decided his track team needed better, lighter running shoes. So he went out of his workshop and poured rubber into family waffle iron. And that's how Nike's famous waffle sold Running Shoe was born, and the rest is history, $116 billion country. Listen, sometimes you see a need, and then you try to fill it. You may not be an engineer, an architect, or any of that, but you have a dream. You have something in your mind. And this is what you, this is what you have to understand and do. The time is now, folks. We can't wait till tomorrow. It is absolutely now. Pray with me, wherever you are, that God will help us to seize this moment, help you to seize this moment as well. There are probably things you've been waiting to do. This is an opportune time now to do it. God, I pray for someone now who, first of all, needs to be in relationship with you. God, I pray now that you would impress upon their hearts that you've always been with they just need to acknowledge that they want you and need you in their lives. That they want this relationship with the God who's so much God that God is so near to us. We thank you, God, for Jesus who came to make this connection for us so that we could be reconnected to you. I pray somebody on this listening today will realize that whatever they've experienced, negatively or positively, whatever ups or downs they have been through, 
that now is the time if they're not in a relationship with you to do it today this is my prayer in Jesus name amen, amen. alright this offering time in our church I want to give you all an opportunity um, to make a contribution uh, to our church we, we want to just thank you all first of all uh, for helping us uh, to help Plummer Elementary School, which is a school that we have uh, adopted. We've been we've adopted the school over three years ago, and um, we um, helped to purchase a couple of bicycles for the school so they can use them as, as an option to help get parents to get registered for this coming school year. And this is partly how your, your gifts are, are being utilized. Um, we also uh, just want to pray for Plummer elementary school and this principal and because there may be other things um, that we want to try to do to help the school um, the school is not in a wealthy uh, district and that's another <laughs> for, for another conversation for another time but they're here in Ward 7 so we want to do all we can to make sure those children uh, get the best education possible by being a partner and collaborating uh, with Plummer Elementary School also we bought a few masks um, this past week from the organization that's doing work um, in Ghana. Um, and so we made a contribution there too as well. Uh, they made some masks and and, uh, and so we, we want to be of, of help to them. So I, I brought some of these masks here today and, and so as you can see they're very nice. They're made by people in Ghana and uh, we just have a few of them but we'll keep a few around if you want one you can just uh, inbox us and say hey you make a donation we'll give you one of these masks i don't know what your donation may be it can be anything you want but we'll give you one all right so now listen if you're a tither we thank you for that everybody in the village i want to thank you for your giving oh you've been so faithful uh just going to give the fire you've been going to to cash app you've just been so so faithful and i really appreciate it. you just don't realize and so i want you to continue to keep on giving and thank you for that so look, wherever you are now, take your time, go to Give the Fire, go to the Cash App. They both can, one can be found on our website, the other can be found on our Facebook page. You can go there and, 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 and give your tithes at this time. Or an offering, perhaps you're not a tither yet, but you can give an offering. So if you don't even have to be a member of the church and you want to make a contribution, you can do that. And we'll make sure that you, 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 know, you get credit for it. It's tax deductible. We are 501c3 church, so you're, you're sowing in good sound and good ground, so we really appreciate it. All right, so we're gonna pray here in a moment, and, but before um, we do that, I just want you to get your, your offering, if you can, or touch your your, your, your pad or your phone, and, and just uh, repeat after me, I have faith and I believe that God will meet my every need as I generously sow this seed, freely I give and freely I receive. That's a powerful thing to happen. Powerful, powerful thing to happen. So if you've done that, we wanna thank you again, for your gifts. And look, here's just a few reminders. Tuesday Spark is every Tuesday at 7.30. Just tune into my Facebook page. That's Lewis Thomas Tate Jr. You can get there and listen to us 7.30 every Tuesday. If you miss it, you can go on my Facebook page and see it again. Um, and uh, it, gets, it gets loaded up to YouTube at some point. Um, also, share this message with other people. If they happen to miss it, uh, you can do a watch party later. On Wednesday mornings, we pray. Every Wednesday morning, 6.15 in the morning, you can join us for prayer. You can get that, uh, get the code and the number from my, from my website, which is Richard Village DC, um, dot church, or our Facebook page, which is Village DC. Then on Wednesday night, we, we're back in Bible study for the summer. The first time I've done a summer Bible study. But it, we're dealing with this subject, It's Your Black Body, looking at the sort of biblical and theological implications of your black body that you've been made in the image and likeness of God. We're having a good time doing it. So join us on Wednesday night at 7.30. And lastly, um, be involved in any way you can uh, in what's going on. And not just because it seems like it's the thing to do, but people are hurting, particularly black people. And this is a long, I hope, a long process in terms of people staying engaged to really bring about change because I really believe we can really get rid of these oppressive policies and systems it not only benefits black folks but it benefits everybody everybody let's pray God I thank you for this time you've given us to share today I pray that we, we that we will really grasp this concept of now 
there's no better time than now. There are many things we can think about that we've put off, that we should do it now. God, I pray that you give grace to all those who are participating in civil disobedience, that you will protect them. I pray, God, that you will move on the hearts of our politicians and other leaders and corporate leaders, that it's time not to just put band-aids on the system, but to completely change the system. This is a great time. Yes, it may be scary for some. Yes, it's challenging, but it can be done. Now unto him who is able to keep us from falling and present us faultless before the very presence of his throne, be power henceforth now and forevermore. Have a great day. And